Welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Bud Elliott. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at youtube.com slash cover3 and all across the 24-7 Sports Facebook network. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe. Smash that like. Come and join us in the chat. Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time as we gather together right now. Lots to get to. Kind of a busy weekend on the coaching carousel. We've got a hiring at Stanford. We've got a firing at Navy. Uh, We've got some offensive coordinator movement, or at least some big names being associated with Jimbo Fisher's search to hire a new offensive coordinator. Uh, Some other movement on the coaching carousel. We also have a uh, sort of a very disturbing and sudden uh, change of events in terms of uh, what's going on at Mississippi State with Mike Leach? We'll get to that just in a little bit, at least in terms of you know what we do know at this time with an evolving story. And before we get out of here, I the best way for me to let you know that the big old bag of mail is going to be opened is for us to just open that big old bag of mail because we want you uh, to get involved with the show here as we enter into uh, December and January. Uh, The big picture questions, the individual school-specific questions, the best way to do it is to leave us a five-star review, and in that review, put your question. We will add it to the big old bag of mail. Uh, We will be hitting some mailbag questions before we get out of here. But I want to begin with the Power 5 job that got filled because after Sacramento State, lost the highest-scoring FCS playoff game in history in the wee hours of the morning. I'm actually kind of sad I wasn't up for it. 66-63. to Gracious. The next morning, we get to find out that Troy Taylor, the head coach of that Sacramento State team, is going to be the new head coach at Stanford. Now, Troy Taylor came up as an offensive uh, assistant. He's a former Cal quarterback, so you know intimate knowledge of the rivalry and all that. Uh, he's been a Pac-12 assistant at Cal. He was a graduate assistant under Rick Neuheisel at Colorado, worked for Steve Mariucci at Cal. And then he went and spent an extended amount of time at Folsom High School in California. Now, there he was shattering state records for offense and it got him the attention of going to get the Eastern Washington gig where he again shattered a whole bunch of records in just one season spends two years at Utah and then gets the gig at Sacramento State he led Sacramento State to unprecedented highs he was named the national coach of the year at the FCS level once he was named the conference coach of the year twice he led them to their first and second The Big Sky Conference titles, Uh, they joined in 1996, by the way, so that's a pretty good run for uh, the Hornets, and then also uh, got himself their first undefeated season, undefeated regular season, that was this year, which came crashing down. So, we know that we're expecting uh, some offense from the arrival of Troy Taylor, but there's a lot more that has to get done in order for Stanford to be able to reverse what has been a couple years of backsliding within the Pac-12. Uh, reactions to the hire and thoughts on what the challenges or what the what the task is at hand for Troy Taylor? Uh, you, you mentioned his success at Sacramento State. Just to put some context to it, he was 30-8 and eight in three years for a winning percentage of 81.1%. He's the 11th coach in program history. He's only the second to leave with a winning record, and the second best record was Bob Matos from 78 to 92, who went 84, 73, and 2. So 53.5%. It's a pretty large. This is a D2 program until like the 90s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a pretty interesting jump. It's a pretty good sign, although. When it comes to that kind of jump, you'd like to see more sustained than that. But still, it's you see those kind of results. You got to think there's something to it. And you mentioned he's got a lot of, uh, you know, experience within the Pac-12 as an assistant. He was an assistant at Utah and at Cal. What's going to be interesting to me though is like Stanford's clearly going to look a little different because when you think of what they were under Harbaugh in Deshaw, we saw them kind of make some adjustments on the offensive side of the ball this year and in recent years, trying to go away from just the ground and pound, you know, smash mouth stuff, getting a little more modernized. I'm wondering what this is going to look like because when Taylor was at Utah for two years, (laughs) the offenses weren't fantastic. It's He and Whittingham kind of had very different views on what they wanted the offense to be. Whittingham wanted to be what you typically see from Utah now, which is, I mean, they're balanced, but they are, kind of like they want everything to be built around the run you know physical football and 
Taylor kind of wanted to throw the ball all over the place. But we saw at Sacramento State this year, they were somewhat balanced. Like it wasn't just dropping back to chuck the ball 70 times a game. They, they were able to run the ball pretty well. So it's I, I don't know exactly what the offense is going to look like. I think it's going to be a lot more spread out than you're typically used to seeing from Stanford. And it'll be interesting to see how they are able to adapt from that or adapt for that for recruiting because it's like we've gone over a whole lot. Recruiting at Stanford right now is a lot more difficult of a situation than it was even for when Shaw first took over and when Harbaugh took over. So with the transfer portal, who knows what it's going to look like. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty fascinated to see how this works out. Uh, I, I do think it's probably a, a good hire overall. And, and from like a power rating standpoint, it would be tough for Stanford to be much worse than they were this year. There's really not a whole lot more you can go down unless you want to get into that like New Mexico State, Nevada uh, you know, Hawaii this year type territory. Uh, and yet there's noise out of Stanford that they're going to improve their NIL, that they're going to uh, have changes as far as allowing transfers in. And I, I kind of will believe it when I see it, this is going to be extremely important though, because they've already been at a transfer deficit for two years running. Mm -hmm. And guys, they have 15 dudes right now in the transfer portal. That's pretty huge. So we're going to know right away, I think, how Stanford is going to allow Troy Taylor to operate. Maybe they'll actually let him take kids in. If not, this is going to be, uh, I think, your front runner for the worst Power 5 team in the country, and maybe by a lot. Like, that's a lot of guys to lose. Heading into next year. Correct, yes. If they change, if they up their NIL, and if they change their transfer game, do you think that Stanford would be able to take the potential of an explosive offense to be able to scoop up some of these wide receivers that might not find landing places. Because if you're going to be able to sell the opportunity to, to see a whole bunch of like looks, a whole bunch of touches, a whole bunch of targets in a game, then that could be a, a way that you start to you know, attack the inefficiency. Cause what I saw from this was that, you know, like you mentioned, Tom, the, the sort of physical brutality of that Harbaugh to early Shaw era, you know, kind of lost its way a little bit. And then David Shaw did have some good quarterbacks and some uh, good wide receivers and tight ends where they were able to bring the vertical passing game. My assumption here is that now you're almost going zig then zag where you're trying to be a team that is going to go really wide and very much try to hit explosive plays and be able to find matchup advantages within the scheme. Like, as I was doing some digging on Taylor to write a story for CBSSports.com on the hire, there was a, a lot of you know commentary on he's just the like flip flip open a notebook and just start all draw, drawing up a play. Like he gets really really into the scheme stuff, and that scheme is going to be something that he's going to try to use as a real advantage here. But how quickly can you even have a the dudes to be able to go out there and execute that scheme at a normal job? One off season, yeah. <laughs> At Stanford right now, it's probably going to take a couple of recruiting classes at off seasons because, like I was saying, we need to see how serious they are about the NIL and the transfer stuff before we can really know how quick. Like this is, I, I would assume, getting the job. It's everybody understands in that you know department. Like this isn't going to be we can fix this in one year. If we're going to make this kind of change to what we what, what I'm going to try to do, it's going to be a couple year like adjustment period. So. I wouldn't, if I'm a Stanford fan, I'm not really expecting to be, you know, going to a bowl game next year. Although maybe, who knows, maybe it works. You never know. That's the fun part of this sport. Yeah, I mean, really, it's to me, it's not about scheme. It, it, it's about your ability to get players in. I, I don't care what scheme you run. The, the current way that Stanford was operating, I don't think Nick Saban would win at Stanford if you can't take any transfers in, personally. Like, like they just, their policies are not congruent with the new rules. That's why David Shaw five, six years ago, was so against the changes that were coming to college football. It was a self-interested thing on his part. And I would do the same thing, obviously. If that's your job, that's where that's where you love. You're like, like he's looking around. He's seeing these changes. He's like, oh, we're, we're cooked. I can't admit it, but I'm going to come out here and really strongly advocate against these potential changes. Mm. Uh, will be very interesting to see how uh, Troy Taylor builds out that staff. But again, a Power 5 job open, a Power 5 job filled. May, might get uh, a little bit on uh, – actually, before we get to, to Navy and Kenny Matalolo, just sort of open question here. We were talking a little bit before we went live. I don't have a good beat on 
uh, at least hearing any buzz on where Purdue is going to go to replace Jeff Brom. The time is ticking. We are now sitting nine days away from the early signing period. Uh, any any thoughts or ha have you have you gotten any like murmurs or whispers? Because I, I seem to be very long on fan lists, you know, on who Purdue fans would like to see. What I am short on is news of where the athletic director, Mike Babinski, is going to be going with this. Seems like it's kind of a buttoned up search unless, Bud, Tom, you, you guys have heard anything else. I, I have heard some stuff uh, just on Twitter this morning about like maybe assistant coaches leaving. Um, Twitter seems to think it's Tyson Helton, the Western Kentucky coach. So that would be interesting. Um, like we had a little discussion this morning in our 24 seven sports Slack chat over which job you'd rather have South Carolina or Purdue. And everybody agreed that it was South Carolina now because the, the divisional changes are coming to the big 10 at some point. Right. But, you know, Shane Beamer was the lowest, lowest paid head coach in the sec. And I'm like, look, man, you can, the expectations at Purdue are more, are more in line with what they should be, I think. But with the divisions changing, and with um, you're having to follow Jeff Brom, who had just some of the most successful seasons in my lifetime of watching Purdue, that is a, a tough gig. So we'll have to see if, if it is indeed uh, Tyson Helton, the, the West Kentucky coach. Yeah, I mean, Helton makes sense in that, I mean. He came from Western Kentucky. Comes from Western Kentucky, <laughs> which is where you got Jeff Brom. But also right. when he was at Western Kentucky, he was the offensive coordinator for Jeff Brom at Western Kentucky. So as far as the kind of system that you're running, Helton can step in and it's you're not going to have to change much of anything on offense in fact I, although I would say honestly I feel like Western Kentucky's a little more pass happy than Brom has been at Purdue but I also think Brom was a lot more pass happy at Western Kentucky and maybe he was adjusting to the conference that he was in a little bit so I could see Helton taking that same kind of if he gets the job taking that same kind of approach so I think that makes sense I still think uh, I mentioned Sean Lewis who's supposed to be the new offensive coordinator at Colorado I think that makes sense Kevin Sumlin is a name that we have floated because he is a Purdue grad. He has had coaching experience. I haven't really heard much as far as traction in that being the direction things are going to go. And everything I've heard, honestly, is from people who don't really know. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. I feel like I've got the fan wish list. Like, everybody's yeah. like, here's who we I, we would like. Here's who makes sense. But um you know, if, if, if this is recently moving in the direction of Tyson Helton, yeah, he, he, Jeff Brom's assistant, the Western Kentucky head coach, the, you want to talk about continuity, that would at least keep things moving in the uh, in the same direction for sure. Yeah, this is this is a lot like the Nebraska search was where I'm not there's not really a whole lot of information getting out. Good, good work by uh, by Purdue then. And uh, and hopefully that's uh, that does move quickly Um, a little bit more recent is the dismissal of coach Ken Niamatololo. It was announced on Sunday that he would not return as head coach. This comes after the overtime loss to Army in America's game on Saturday. He is the winningest coach in program history with 109 victories. And Navy finished with four or fewer wins, but Navy finished with four or fewer wins four times in the past five seasons. Uh, they are also started to fall behind in the rivalry with Army and fallen behind also in the American Athletic Conference as you know they came in and competed for a conference title like almost immediately, maybe in that first year, 2015, 2016 type era. But they've become a, very much a, a bottom of the conference type team. So, number one, I, I look at the way that uh, Ken Niamatololo has impacted the rest of the coaches in the sport and the way that he's impacted the Naval Academy. And I think I don't know who you can get that would be better than Ken Niamatololo. But we also remember the friction over uh, his offensive coordinator and, and the friction with the athletic director and the results, as I've just mentioned, have been going in the wrong direction. Is what in the world does Navy do now having, you know, parted ways with a head coach that has been there? I mean, wasn't he offensive coordinator for uh, Paul Johnson when Paul Johnson left for uh, Georgia Tech? So mm -hmm. we've essentially been dealing with the same, like, ever, for as long as we've covered college football, we've been dealing with, like, Navy not having a coaching search. 
Now we've got a Navy coaching search, and I have no idea what the move is here for the mids. Uh, I, I think Brian Bohannon makes a lot of sense. Kennesaw State head coach. Yeah, who was – he coached at Navy with Niyama Tololo for a few years. He went with Paul Johnson to Georgia Tech. He has familiarity with the offense. Obviously, he has familiarity with the Naval Academy. I think – I mean, it's – it's weird. It's not like when Navy and Army come open, it is not the same kind of coaching search that you have in other places because you're kind of limited into what you're trying to do because, I mean, you kind of have to run the option offense. Like, there's been people that have speculated about can you do something different there, but it's like when you have size requirements for who you can recruit to put on your offensive and your defensive line, you kind of have to. You're kind of very limited in what you can do, and it's getting harder and harder because of, like, the cut block rules that they're passing it makes it more difficult to execute the way that army and Navy want to execute. So it's, it's not, it is not an easy solution, but it's also somewhat easier because like I said, it, it, there's a very narrow pool of coaching candidates who you would think could take it. Like it's going to be guys who have been assistants at Navy at army or who are very familiar have, you know, who are running option offenses. And I think of the potential candidates, unless it's somebody that's already currently on the staff, I think Bohannon makes the most sense. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Tom on that. I mean, look, sometimes you just got to make a change. I, I think Ken did a good job this year, to be honest, relative to my expectations for that team. But maybe Navy has higher expectations. I don't really know why it would, but that game at the end of the year is sort of the game that matters to them. Mm -hmm. they, they could go 1-11 as long as that one is the Army game. Now, that's a little bit hyperbole, but... I, I I do think there's some truth it's, in that. It's not, it's not that yeah. bad of a hyperbole. Yeah. Just, no. just listen to anybody who's at the academy talk to each other and have them say "beat army" every single time they say "what up." Would Would you ever consider dropping down to FCS with 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 these new cut block rules? I mean, it's players aren't getting smaller. The rules are are not moving more in your favor; they're moving less in your favor. Like, do you care about being more competitive week to week? Do you really think somebody's going to do better than, than than Ken did there? I thought Ken did a great job. I know. I would not, but that's because you're entrenched in you're entrenched in your history. Like the very beginning of the sport is Army and Navy playing as the best football programs in the country. And I I think that moving down to the FCS level is relinquishing your connection to that history of being one of the like first iconic programs in college football history. I mean, I I think there could be an argument made to go back to being an independent, but I even, I don't even know if that's cause like being an independent is just as difficult these days as anything. And then also like, cause there's the theory out there that, you know, like you said, Chip, when they first got to the American, they were doing well as they've been in there every single year. It seems like the performance is dropping off a little bit and it's like, well, maybe it's because the rest of the conference is, you know, becoming more accustomed to having Navy in it. So everybody's better prepared for it. But then you look at Air Force in the Mountain West, and it's like, well, they're I think they're like 20 and 8 in the last four years in Mountain West play. So the Mountain West hasn't caught on to Air Force. So that, I don't know if that's realistically what it is. Just I, I don't know. I think that, I mean, remember a few years ago, Ken almost took the Arizona job. Like that was happening until like Khalil, Khalil Tate, Tate got, got on, on Twitter. Twitter and said, I'm not running the option. And it kind of, there was enough pushback from that and the fan base that, to keep that from happening. So, I don't know. And it does feel like that was kind of an inflection point as to when things kind of started going in the wrong direction there. Then you mentioned the friction between them and, and people in charge over the coaching staff, losing the army. I, it, it might just be like Bud said, just change. You, you need to change right now. You need to freshen things up. You don't really need to change who you are and what you do. You just need a new voice in the room possibly to kind of get things going and start over. I would add <clears throat> Army offensive coordinator Brent Davis also yeah. might be uh, might be a look. I don't know if Army and Navy do those swaps right there where you can go from one to the other, but um, I, I like the Brian mm -hmm. Bohannon suggestion from Tom. It's it is an important hire because um, this is this is a program that does have the proud history. It has national championship history. And, uh, and and you are finding yourself moving in the opposite direction from where you want to be within the American Athletic Conference. And I will say this, um, a couple of people that are watching us live, and thanks to everybody who hangs out and watches live, the American Athletic Conference is also getting the big reboot. Mm -hmm. We keep talking about it. Like, this is Navy, like North Texas, like Charlotte, 
this, all deciding, okay, this, this conference is about to have a total reset right now. We don't think that we have a coach in place who's going to be able to lead us in this sort of race to the to, to get in place in the pecking order. So it will be another first year coach in a brand new landscape in the American Athletic Conference. Uh, will be it adds another layer of interest uh, to the action that we have ahead in 2023. All right, before we hit the break. Uh, news on Sunday that Mississippi State head coach Mike Leach was transported uh, to the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson following a personal health issue. Uh, what we have seen since then are reports that include the Mississippi Clarion Ledger uh, reportedly describing the situation as dire. What I have seen that concerns me the most is the outpouring of support and the tone of the messages that are coming from Leach's peers within the coaching community. That, uh, you know, what we are seeing reportedly as a situation that is dire or even critical uh, might be very, very serious. On the football stand so standpoint, Zach Arnett has been elevated to interim coach of the team. They are going to be playing, or at least are scheduled to be playing, in the ReliQuest Bowl against Illinois in early January, but for Leach, um, I, I guess we're going to keep tabs on, on this and try to, you know, relay as much as we can or provide whatever context as we can. But the, what's, what's sort of our, our read on, on what's going on here? How do, how do we process um, this information that somebody who just got their first egg bowl win, what, 18 days ago, now all of a sudden um, you know, looking like a, we've got a real serious health issue on our hands. Uh, in the last 15 minutes, the uh, Clarion Ledger released a report that I'm not going to go into all the details, but um, Mike Leach had a massive heart attack Sunday in Starkville in his home. And this is all the Clarion Ledger is reporting. Uh, he was unattended to for 10 to 15 minutes before he was able to get medical help to get it on the line. There are reporting via sources that Leach may have suffered seizures with the possibility of brain damage. So... Uh -huh. I'd, it's uh you know it's a serious situation and i don't know it's it's i you don't really know what to say about stuff like this except you hope and you pray that the worst does not happen and mike leach is able to pull through and from the messages that you said that you've seen from coaches in the last 24 hours since all this stuff started going down like you know there's a, it's a very serious and scary situation right now for mike leach and i I don't know what else to add. Yeah, I mean, I'm, like Mike Leach is is somebody I think we all love as people who cover college football because he's he's such a character, you know, and and, and is the guy who is the antithesis of gotta have you know gotta be football twenty four seven and and just nonstop, uh, you know, gotta, gotta grind, gotta grind, right? Like no 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 time for fun. I mean, you know, like like we we need we need more of that, not not less. And so, you know, my, my prayers go out to Mike Leach and his family. Um, yeah, you know, I agree with Chip. Like when I. That's kind of the tale is not, hey, coach, get, you know, get well soon. Like, look forward to you know, seeing it on the sideline. It's, it's, hey, coach, pull through, you know, so, hey, coach, pull through. Um, I never went to Pullman or Lubbock or Starkville, but I did sit with Mike Leach in the ECU press box in Greenville because he spent one season between uh, Texas Tech and Washington State working for CBS Sports Network. Sat down for an interview, was very gracious with his time. I was very inexperienced. I asked bad questions, and I appreciated his patience at the time. The thing that um, I have, I was thinking about Mike Leach throughout the morning, and it is the idea that in those places, you know, whether it's Lubbock, whether it's Pullman, whether it's Starkville, they, they all were the perfect fit for somebody who was going to be all about talent evaluation, who is going to be the right fit for his team, player development once he got the players in there and then on top of that using scheme to be able to close the gap with the rest of the conference he was a floor raiser and when things uh really came together all at once we'd see those teams pop as it did at texas tech as they did at washington state and you'd all of a sudden be contending for conference titles double digit wins but just the ability for him to um at these different places close the gap, raise the floor uh, is really a testament to, to coaching um, at, at all levels, both uh, in the chalkboard and the preparation, but also in the talent evaluation and the talent development. Um, so I'm, you know, we're, we're rooting for, 
rooting for Mike Leach right now, for sure. Coming up on the other side, a very interesting name connected to the search for Jimbo Fisher's new offensive coordinator. Will he bring the 30-point games that Aggies fans have been so desperate to see on the scoreboard? We'll get into that. Plus, your questions answered. We're opening up the big old bag of mail. Next. You'd be Mrs. Dutton. I would. Seems we neighbors have acquired the Strafford Ranch. Well, this is the Yellowstone, and you have no rights here. Jacob, you can't start a range war. Range war's already started. New series streaming December 18th, exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. If you're watching live on YouTube right now, you just saw an advertisement for Paramount+. Plus. It's the holiday spirit, you know, feeling the generous. So here's what we're going to do. If we get the likes up on this video, then we will be giving out three 30-day free trials to Paramount+. Plus. Again, that is three 30-day free trials to Paramount+. Plus. So let's get those likes up on the video. You hit, we're going to do five. Yeah, I we're feel gonna... charitable. Oh, ho, ho, ho. look at Tom Claus over here coming through with extra P-plus gift card. All right, so here's the deal. Like the video right now. If it hits 150 likes by the end of the show, we will be giving out five paramount plus 30 day free trials uh so go ahead smash that like button uh so that we can give out these paramount plus 30 day free trials okay so um we had reporting from over the weekend that a candidate for the texas a&m offensive coordinator job is a man named bobby petrino and it brought you know some some thoughts here where i thought uh there's two operative questions number one who should Jimbo Fisher hire as offensive coordinator. And number two, who will Jimbo Fisher hire as offensive coordinator? Your suggestions and your predictions. And of course, all this coming once again from the news breaking that Bobby Petrino, currently the Missouri State head coach, is reportedly a candidate to get that job in College Station. I mean, I, I tweeted that uh, I guess Art Browse was unavailable to call plays. If, if you look at that staff that they're putting together there. It's a in, wild in staff, Station. boy. I mean, uh, crazy. so you got, you got DJ Durkin. You got, you got Steve Adazio. You got Jimbo. And now you may have Petrino. Uh, Culture-wise, kind of hard to see that all working out, right? Not necessarily guys you want to send your kids to play for. However... From a pure football standpoint, Bobby Petrino can coach. And I do wonder if Petrino has the kind of cachet and just the ultimate kind of, can I say F you to him yes. on, this, on this pod? All right. Mm -hmm. To tell Jimbo to shove it if Jimbo tries to jump in and call plays over top of him. Or, mm. you know, like, Bobby Petrino's He's made got a ton the of money. Yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, like, he may not, he may not take, it, take the lip from Jimbo – if Jimbo tries to jump in there and call plays. Yeah. Right that's Gerald Dickey didn't coach a Heisman trophy winner. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I think with Petrino. It is like, as far as the off field stuff and what happened at Arkansas and all that kind of stuff, it's, you know, going to get headlines, but again, DJ Durkin's on the staff. So I feel like Bobby Petrino is, you know, not exactly a big deal, but I do agree with you, bud, in that, Jimbo needs to hire somebody. I don't have anybody specific in mind, but he needs to hire somebody that a, has ideas that are different than what Jimbo is doing that maybe, you know, you don't have to completely abandon your offense, but just get some new ideas in there. Some, just some fresh eyes, some fresh ideas, some new wrinkles. And B, who has the ability to not only you know tell you those ideas, but to actually have to have the kind of respect and credit that you can live to them. And maybe, like you just said, the, uh, the chutzpah to tell, tell Jimbo to just you know f off if I, this is my offense this is what I do and Bobby Petrino does have all that like this is not a situation where Bobby Petrino needs this job so if he's taking it you would think that there was still some assurances that like all right you're gonna have some you know responsibility you're gonna have some control and some power over what the offense is doing so it it will get a lot of 
you know, funny tweets and headlines about it if it happens. But I don't think it's a terrible hire if it happens. Well, it also, you know, really brings out the, you know, the the SEC like bubble and everything that only happens within the SEC is what matters mm-hmm. that his arrival at Texas A&M would take us all the way back to Arkansas as though he did not again coach a Heisman trophy winning quarterback in his return to Louisville and have Louisville up in the top 10 in the rankings, have them going seven and one in conference play, losing on a tiebreaker by four yards to Clemson during the 2016 season. Now, did it collapse hilariously? Absolutely. Yes. But again, all of these things have happened, both the highs and the very, very lows. A Louisville team that was so bad that odds makers could not make the point spreads big enough. They were failing to cover by like three touchdowns, not losing by three touchdowns, failing to cover the spread by three touchdowns during Bobby Petrino's last season at Louisville. But again, all of this has happened since Arkansas, but I feel like if he does get hired, we're immediately going to go back and look, and I, we did a, um, there was a a web series on S on SB nation called Bomani and Jones starring Bomani Jones. Hayes Permar and I were the producers of that. We like helped them, you know, write them. We edited, we directed a bunch. Would you of them. say that you made Bomani Jones? No, he made me. Just, yeah, wait, yeah, you yeah. produced that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's awesome. I was working yeah. there at the time. Yeah. So like the Bobby Petrino episode, like continuously gets like referenced and pointed out as people say, it's like one of their favorites, the Bobby Petrino book of lies. Like I, I profited off that joke as much as, you know, anybody else. And so I, I get it. But I was like, come on, man, we've had a lot of Bobby Petrino happen since we, uh, since he got on the motorcycle and toughed it out all the way to uh, to the hospital on his own to try and make sure that that wasn't going to get uncovered. The uh, I don't know if we can play this on the air, but if you guys want to laugh hard, there this is like from like the like a very internet time. But the ballad of Bobby Petrino, I know I dropped this in our group chat, is a tremendous ninety second song, which I think is done. Who's the guy out of Memphis who makes these Chris Vernon songs? Yes, Chris I Vernon. it sounds like a Chris Vernon song. I'm pretty sure it is. It is. Look it up on YouTube. It is uh, It is well done. <laughs> See, that's another thing with Bobby Petrino. If Jimbo hires him, just think of all these human meat shields he's surrounding himself with so that way he doesn't get any of the heat when things go wrong. <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> what's, what's, what is Jimbo Fisher going to do to avoid everything? Yeah. Just hire a bunch of fall guys. <laughs> exactly. You want to come to College Station? take a fat salary and coach future NFL players who don't want to be here. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Um, the, the staff is bananas and Texas A&M fans, I guess you get, you get excited about the talent that's coming in and you hope that everybody, uh, you know, every, everybody buys in because that's, that is not a staff that encourages, that is encouraging to me as someone who has to make project projections and predictions in terms of how things are going to go moving forward. Uh, Anything else uh, from the coaching carousel, either the assistant coaching carousel or any kind of buzz catch your eye before we jump into the big old bag of mail. Still waiting on South Carolina's new OC. Um, I know Brad, Brad Crawford from 24 seven sports has reported uh, Dow Loggins as likely there. I think Uh, Arkansas, I don't know how hard they're trying to keep him. Maybe hard, maybe not, not really sure there. Uh, also, an interesting report, transfer portal-wise, which I think ties into this, is that uh, South Carolina has interest in Devin Leary. I had kind of assumed that Spencer Rattler, because he had a bad year, was coming back. Maybe that's a poor assumption on my part. That he would just go pro? Or go hit yeah, the portal I, and like try to go get another can he, can he portal again? I, I, oh. I don't know if he's graduated. Oh... Uh, uh, insert joke about South Carolina academics. I can't talk. I mean, you know, <laughs> fake classes and all in Chapel Hill. <laughs> Are you, what do you think about the Philip Montgomery hire at Auburn? Okay, yeah, I actually think that these hires that he's making, because he also got Ron Roberts apparently from Baylor. Mm-hmm. I think if you're an Auburn fan, you should be encouraged about this because so far, all the hires that Freeze had made, it was like, okay, this is uninspired. This shows Freeze' lack of coaching tree connections. Not really into this. It's like you're just getting the same guys back from Ole Miss for the, and some Liberty dudes, and you kept Cadillac, which cool, probably good, good move. But 
I think Phil Montgomery, uh, he knows how to run that Baylor system. Mm -hmm. uh, now, let's go back. When was uh, – oh, shoot. Kid who signed, who signed with uh, with Texas Tech, I think it was, and transferred to Auburn. He was on the Patriots for a while. A uh, really highly rated kid. Quarterback? Yeah. Um, oh. Chad uh, Leno. The kid from – oh, God. Are you sure the not the Baylor guy who went to Auburn? And then oh, excuse me. Uh, yeah, Baylor. I think yeah, the, the Baylor guy who went to Auburn was um, what's his name? Chat will know. Stidham. Thank you, Jared. Yeah, Stidham. Jared. Sorry, guys. There I'm, we go. I am uh, I am very medicated today to be able to do the show because I think I have what Danny has, except Danny went to the doctor. My whole family's at the doctor right now. <laughs> by the way, uh, Matt, Matt, Mags is like I'm doing my self appointment, and the two boys, you you schedule your own. I was like, all right, cool. All right, so. One of the reasons that Auburn got Stidham was that Gus was like friendly with that old Baylor staff, right? And there's that kind of thing where like these guys who used to be high school football coaches all kind of run together. And obviously Hugh was a high school coach from, you know, that Me Memphis, right? Sorry. Um, anyway, like I do think that there's probably some kind of connection there. I would guess like the former high school coach thing with, you know, Montgomery knowing the Baylor staff pretty well. And th that staff having been former high school coaches. I don't think there's anything wrong with Phil Montgomery, man. No, neither do I. Tulsa, Tulsa like there's a thing. It's just, if you're an AD, sometimes you got to fire a guy to keep the booster donations coming in. Cause it's hard to sell like, Hey man, I know in five and seven, that's a great year for us at Tulsa. Big money boosters don't want to hear like narrowly missing out on the bowl is a good year, even though it is by what Tulsa's resources are. They you got to be able to sell them something new and shiny to keep that check coming in. That's why Montgomery got fired, I think. So I think it's probably a good hire. Yeah, I mean, I think Hugh's probably still going to be at the helm of the offense, but I think having Montgomery in there with his knowledge of that offense and just, again, like we are talking about with Jimbo, just fresh eyes, somebody else with some maybe some different ideas you can get in there to – update what you're doing and just keep you know try to stay ahead of the curve i think is good the roberts higher on defense i mean i don't know you're you're auburn you're gonna have talented players on that side of the ball so you'll probably be fine <laughs> but i just it's like if if aranda didn't want me anymore that kind of concerns me just that's, the idea that that's fair i auburn's defense is a high floor proposition yeah, you've got so you're gonna have tons of talent. You could probably run any damn scheme you feel like running, and you'll that's, be okay. That's yeah. You don't you don't need the, uh, the, the to be super intricate. Line up and play forty three. Mm -hmm. you you'll be good. You've got the dudes to be able to to get it done. You just hope your pass defense isn't horrendous. All right, time to dive into the big old bag of mail. Uh, as always, the best way to add a question to a future mailbag segment is to go and leave us a five-star review. And in that review, put your question. We'll throw it in the big old bag of mail. We'll tackle it in a future mail bag episode. This question comes from Jake. Dear Cover 3 Pod, it's coaching carousel season, and I have an important question. As Tom and Chip already know, it is somewhat common for European soccer teams to rehire coaches they have fired, for example, Chelsea and Mourinho or Madrid and Ancelotti. So, when we when will we finally see this happen in college football? There are only a finite number of blue blood jobs and programs are firing coaches left and right. Eventually, a program will rehire a coach that they have fired. Do y'all have any guesses as to who is the first? I'll say the obvious one and Auburn will rehire Gus Malzahn yeah. in 3 years. <laughs> uh go balls, Jake. <laughs> I do think that is the obvious one. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Who would be? I mean, I think Bud clearly wants Florida State to bring Jimbo back. Yep. Yeah, that would be, that would be quality. Uh. <laughs> but that, see, that's not the fire. So I was I was going through oh. and I was saying. Oh, okay. yeah. I, I got one. Okay. You know, like. I think there's probably a Chris Christopherson song about this somewhere, but a guy, you know, goes out to LA, finds it really wasn't wasn't right for him. He's a native Texas guy. He, he's he's a true Okie at heart. <laughs> Lincoln Riley comes back to Oklahoma in like 2030 and is embraced. No way, Tebow. <laughs> They're still using that. Yeah, I know. 
I'm like, the guy won the Heisman Trophy. Uh, his play quarterback did again, and then they they were one game away from the playoff. Yeah, well, you know. Wait, what? What's what's Tebow? T B O W. The that blank, blank out, out west. west. They, uh, that's what they call him on social media. Yeah. Yeah, they're. No, nah, that's 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 not it. Uh, As what they I, insist that they are not mad. By the way, <laughs> still not mad. Ed Odron at LSU. No, that's never happening. It, it was personal, and we have seen that if you can exhibit growth, that you wrap that championship ring on the table, start talking about these recruiting visits all over the state of Louisiana. I had Coach O on my list as someone that we could see with the rehire from firing because, you know, like Bobby Petrino comes back to Louisville, but when he left Louisville, he left on his own accord. Mac Brown comes back to North Carolina. He left for another job. There are a lot of examples of leaving and then coming back, including Urban Meyer from Florida to Florida in the same oh, offseason. Yeah, I was going to go Urban Meyer, Florida. Like, what, what if Billy Napier is just a really good recruiter and can't coach? I don't think that's the case. I think he's probably a good coach. But what if he's not? Urban has a history of taking over super loaded rosters. If you guys are longtime college football fans, I know you guys are just talking about like our audience. Ron Zook had that, had that roster loaded to the gills when Urban took it over there. What if Billy crushes it in recruiting? They're going to have a really strong close. Check us out Wednesday live at 11 a.m., by the way. We're going to have Steve Wiltfong on. Got got the number one, dudes. Let's uh, go. Coming on, coming on cover three. So really excited about that. Uh, but like Florida should close really strong. What if Napier is not actually good at coaching these guys? And Urban Meyer's like, oh, it's a loaded roster. No state tax. Uh, I'm tired <laughs> of running this bar up here. What if Ryan Day loses to Michigan again? What if Urban Meyer goes back to Ooh. Ohio State? How much How much could he ask for? Like $15 million? Oh, God. Yeah, probably. He'd have leverage, yeah. Mm-hmm. And again, like this is – this is not saying that this is going to happen immediately. We're just trying to get the question is asking us to guess the programs where we could see a, uh, a coach who has been fired by that program also get rehired. I mean, Bud is all about enchilada, right? Yeah, for sure. Bud's, you know, Carlo. Car- Bud's yeah. Got, oh yeah. Like, Carlo. He's got his books. He reads all about it. Um, but it's, I mean, the, based off of what the question is based, like, the soccer is so different because so many coaches and managers in soccer aren't really sticking around for more than three to four years anyway. Like that's kind of just how it works. Mm-hmm. So college football is not, there's a lot of similarities in the sports, but but that's not really one of them because typically coaches aren't leaving those jobs unless they get fired after failing there. Managers in soccer will leave on their own accord all the time. So another personal issue led to the demise where I think you could potentially bridge it. Steve Sarkeesian walks back through the Coliseum, leading USC. No. Scott Frost back to Nebraska? No. No. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Um, Tom Hosbolini well, back, back to, to Nebraska. Nebraska. Perry Alvarez back to Wisconsin after Luke Fickle. Again. <laughs> Again. Because he already did the Rose Bowl at one time, right? That's what I'm saying. Barry Alvarez just coaching Wisconsin once every five years from here till eternity. Um, God, I don't know. I think we got some good ones. We got some good ones. And speak, and this is just a good transition because you just uh, mentioned Nebraska. Uh, this next question comes from Joy. Joy says, love the show. I don't get to catch you live, but your podcast always makes my workouts better after work. Keep going, Joy. You can do this as you're working out right now. I was wondering what grade you guys would give the Huskers hiring of Matt Rule. I know what locals think, but I am wondering what the perception nationally is. Also, how does it rank with Wisconsin's hire of Luke Fickle? Thanks for the insight, guys. Go Big Red. Now, the Matt Rule hire, of course, went official over Thanksgiving weekend, right? It was Mm-hmm. Friday, Black Friday, when um, you know we were we were getting the news live, we did an instant reaction show. We've had a lot more time uh, to be able to digest it. And once the coaching carousel calms down, we will have our annual recap of the entire coaching carousel uh, coming up. We do still have a few jobs left to fill before I feel like we can really put our stamp on it and consider the coaching carousel done for the off season. But 
uh, we will be doing that probably in early to mid January. Um, let's let's let all the bowl games get through, and then we'll see if any more uh, firings uh, end up coming down the pike. But for Nebraska and Matt Rule, we've had some time to digest it since our instant reaction show, and you know listeners want to know, and we'll, we'll we'll give you the answers. What what's the grade? What's the national perception? The gray, I mean, again, I don't, I hate giving out grades. I have no idea if it'll work, I think. But based on fit and what we thought, I mean, I was, as soon as the job came open, Matt Rule is one of the first names we were all saying on this show as a name that made a whole lot of sense for that job. And he ended up getting it. So as far as that's concerned, I give it an A. And I do think that, you know, nationally, I don't know what the national perspective is. I think everybody's just kind of moved on. Like, yeah, no, that makes plenty of sense. We'll see. I think that's kind of where Nebraska just is in the overall college football zitgeist right now, whereas it's we've heard so much about that program in recent years with, you know, Scott Frost was going to be the guy to save them. And this was going to be, and it's just, I think nationally outside of Lincoln, most people are just kind of taking a wait and see approach with Nebraska. Like they look at Matt Rule and they say, that's a good hire. There's a lot of stuff in place there for Nebraska to win games. Big Ten's changing. Wait and see. I, I, I agree with Tom on that. Um, I think Matt Rule is encouraging because he has had to build staffs to fit different places before. Mm -hmm. So Temple is very different than Baylor culturally, and, and he got guys who resonated in those markets, like different dudes. So I assume that he will do a good job uh, of that with Nebraska. I'm just going to be looking to, to their recruiting class. Is Nebraska able to buy guys? That's kind of the thing there because there's not a lot of talent around that school. You're not able to keep these dudes home uh, as walk-ons and uh, strength program them into All-Americans anymore. So are you out there competing for top kids and finding ways to get kids to come to Nebraska? That's what it's going to come down to. So I think Matt Rule can coach. Can you get players? What's the staff looking like so far? So he's hired a couple of dudes who've worked with him before. Did they hire a DC yet? I I was looking Not, at that over the weekend. I hadn't checked. If they have, I didn't see it. I'm assuming that the expectations are not going to give enough time for two really bad years before you pop. Because that's what we saw at Baylor. We saw we was I mean, obviously he took over an awful situation from the roster to the atmosphere and environment around the program. And it was going to take a little bit. You know, they really, really bottomed out there into the Bryles era, the um, you know, one year of Jim Grove. But I, I'm very curious to see if I'm curious to see how Matt rule has or hasn't been impacted by his time at the Carolina Panthers, because the one thing that I would describe from the Matt rule experience, at least my view of it from somebody who's not covering the NFL um professionally is that there was a there was a big sort of like out of touch kind of kind of feeling with him especially with the people who cover the NFL and who cover uh, the Carolina Panthers on a regular basis that the way that a college coach can command that media room and sort of almost like force their messaging uh, into existence that there was a lot of pushback there and I don't know, I don't have a better idea feel for Lincoln in terms of whether that's going to work. I do think that that works a lot more in college than it does at the NFL, but I'm curious to see how that sort of Lincoln community is has or hasn't been affected by the Scott Frost experience and whether they'll take to that same kind of messaging, that that very collegiate approach of, uh, of, of trying to make things maybe a little bit better than they really are, or at least like change the way that they're discussed. That's probably what I'm very interested in the press conferences. Back to the D.C. point. Friday, Matt Rule announced that Tony White will be the Nebraska's defensive coordinator. He had been the defensive coordinator the last three years at Syracuse. That's also, a great hire. Yep. And Donovan Rayola will remain as the offensive line coach, too. So, but yeah, no, um, I think back to your point there, Chip, I do think he will find the media in Lincoln much more amenable than what he found in the NFL. Yes. <laughs> so look at yeah. this, these faces <laughs> it's, it's the only show in town yeah mm -hmm. so when you when you start telling them the way it is you get a lot more like you got it coach mm -hmm. yeah that's well listen that's you found a spot where you're at least going to be able to do that uh all right 
we asked and you have answered. You smashed the like button and we appreciate that. So go ahead and drop your handles in the chat. Uh, we will give out five. So make sure, oh, make sure you're following Cover 3 Podcast on Twitter. Drop your Twitter handles in the chat. We're giving out five. Five lucky live viewers will be getting a 30-day Paramount Plus free trial. Uh, thanks to those of you who've already been a lucky recipient of this. Saw somebody comment that they are already enjoying it. So whether you're watching Tulsa King, whether you're watching Beavis and Butthead, whether you are watching uh, the wonderful library of content that is at the top of the mountain of entertainment, Yellowstone, all of it. It's all there for you. Uh, drop your handles in the chat. Make sure you are following the Cover 3 podcast. As Bud mentioned, I didn't know we were going to get the ace, the five-star number one, Steve Wiltfong out here. But yeah, Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern time, it is going to be our National Signing Day preview. Again, we are currently nine days away, so on Wednesday we'll be one week out from the opening of the early signing period in that December National Signing Day. Uh, so make sure you come and join us for that. And you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernelli. You can follow him at Bud Elliott 3. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. See y'all.